Well, hi everyone. My name is Ida and I'm the CEO of iRewild and we're quite excited that all of you can join us today. While we wait in the chat box, please say hello and tell us where you're from and uh, share with us what you'd like to learn more in relationship with nature. We'd love to hear from you. Now, in order to minimize distractions, we're going to kindly ask everyone to keep your microphone on mute throughout the presentation. And if you're having trouble with the video or sound signal, try turning your video off by clicking on the video camera icon located in the control bar on the bottom left of your screen. It often helps to see and hear the presenter as it cuts down on the bandwidth required for your connection. And during the presentation, please send us your questions using the chat box. And at the end of the presentation, we'll try to answer as many questions as, we, as time allows. As we're about to begin, I'd like to introduce you to the board chairman of Ivy Wild, Dr. Peter Angood. Dr. Angood practiced as an academic trauma surgeon for 25 years has published hundreds of articles and was the inaugural chief patient safety office officer for the joint commission and works with the national quality forum he's currently ceo and president of the american association for physician leadership welcome peter thank you ida and welcome to everyone who's joined us from all around the world it's certainly our privilege to be able to host this meeting for those of you who don't really uh, know about iRewild, iRewild is a think tank, an international community of established and emerging thought leaders who are bringing, working to bring our human souls back into a conscious relationship with nature. Our initiatives seek to foster eco-citizens, to create a more reciprocal relationship between the human psyche, modern society, and our natural world. All of this in order to foster a thriving and flourishing planet for all inhabitants, human and non-human. We all need to cultivate new ways of knowing and being with one another as we attune ourselves to the holistic aspects of our living planet and the complex world in which we live. And as we all know, there's much that needs to be done to help our earth and to help our universe. And it's only through this soulful awareness of the interconnectedness of our world that we can make a greater impact and not amongst these large, large challenges. So I Rewild is just wonderfully happy to have uh, Liz Gutierrez join us today. Liz is a writer, a nature lover, and a bridge between human and nature. She, as a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist in private practice in Davis, California, Dr. Gutierrez is interested in understanding the experience of human suffering and how to transcend it. Her passion lies in the work of human ecological restoration, helping to restore humanity's consciousness back to the recognition of its own true nature and its place of belonging in the web of life. She is especially interested in helping people to reopen and reawaken their previously dormant creative channels so that they can can become the fullest expression of themselves and help to reimagine and co-create a new world for our future. So with that, Liz, I'm very much looking forward to your presentation and please go ahead and share your screen and I'll monitor the questions in the chat box and I'll help to facilitate and foster the discussion at the end of your presentation. Please, Liz. Liz, you're on mute. You're on mute. As, as someone once told me, uh, as a facilitator in national and international meetings, a third of their time is telling people they're on mute. So thank you. You got us. Yeah, thank you for telling me I was on mute. I, last time I did this presentation, I didn't even have my slides up. So thank you. Thank you for uh, the introduction, Peter. Thank you, Ida. And welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here this morning. It's great that we have such a global audience because this is such a global topic. So let me go ahead and share my screen and hope that that works. All right. Everyone can see my slides and You're up. hear yep. me. Perfect. 
So welcome, welcome to this talk on the development of ecological consciousness in childhood. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Gutierrez. I'm a child and adolescent and adult psychiatrist here in Davis, California on, on land that I want to formally acknowledge um, is land that was formally inhabited by and stewarded by people of the Wintun Nation for many, many generations. But I go by Liz. And alongside my medical training and background, I'm simply a lover of the natural world and specifically a lover of our oceans. So this is a picture of me in front of, the, uh, in front of Bodega Bay along the Northern California coastline, uh, about hundred miles west of where I live. And I was born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii and my parents, including my mom who's on the call, um, and ancestors in this lifetime are from Vietnam. So I like to say that my heart has always revolved around the Pacific Ocean and I find the, the power of nature and water and ultimately love to be very healing. So super happy to be here with you and my passion and my purpose is in reconnecting people to nature and restoring humanity's ecological consciousness. And you are in the right place if you also love our planet Earth and you want to do your part in creating a sustainable, healthy, harmonious future for all of us. And you want to learn more about ecological consciousness, what it is and how it develops in children and adults because many adults have not developed our ecological consciousness. And this is something that we have to actively reawaken and reclaim. And you want to learn how our psychological models of development affect our children and ourselves as members of this earth community and the impact this has on our well being and the well being of our planet. So here's a roadmap of where we're going today. I'm gonna to go over what is logical consciousness. And I'm gonna take you on an experiential journey through child development. So you can experience for yourself how an ecological consciousness can develop. And we're gonna explore and discuss how our models of development are, affect our experience of ourselves and our well being and the well being of our planet. So let's just start off with what is ecological consciousness? Uh, a simple definition of consciousness is an awareness of yourself and the world around you. And your consciousness can grow and develop as you gain experience and develop increasing awareness. It also develops based on how you interpret your experiences and awareness. And so this is why our models of development are so important because they really provide a framework and lens for how we interpret our experiences. So my definition of ecological consciousness is an awareness of oneself as part of an interconnected, interdependent part of a larger intelligent ecosystem of life. And I want to distinguish it from environmental consciousness, which we often hear thrown around a lot. Now, are you environmentally conscious? Are you buying environmentally conscious products? Because environmental consciousness sometimes still views the environment as something separate from us, whereas ecological consciousness really takes into consideration that we and the environment are part of the same organism and we are interconnected. So how does ecological consciousness develop? I'm gonna take you on an experiential journey through Eric Erickson's stages of psychosocial development alongside my own theory of how an ecological consciousness develops. Eric Erickson was a German American developmental psychologist and psychoanalyst in the 1900s whose theories of the development of the ego the self have had a tremendous influence in Western psychology. As a psychiatrist, a child psychiatrist, I studied Freud and Erickson and Winnicott and Piaget. And all of these theorists were important and relevant to their times, but 
none of them talked about an ecological consciousness. So this has been missing in our modern framework of development. And here I want to really highlight that indigenous cultures just raise their children with an ecological consciousness. They, they may not have had a formal model for it, but it's just the way they lived. So I am basing my framework and my theory on my own direct experience of reclaiming my ecological consciousness while honoring with great humility the wisdom of our indigenous ancestors who lived in connection with the land and the nature for, for many, many generations. Now, this will not be a traditional lecture because I'm a firm believer in direct experience. So instead of just feeding you information, I'm gonna take you on a journey. And I want you to take in the information in the next section of this talk through your senses. Because we're primarily, there's three types of learning. We're, we're visual, we're auditory, so what we see, what we hear, and we're, we're kinesthetic. What we feel in our bodies, our, our movements and sensations. So as I go through the next slides, I really want you to take in the information, not through your intellect, but through your senses. And I've really put together a series of slides where I want you to pay attention to the images, the colors, the words that I'm using, my voice, and then just reflect on your own childhood experiences, whatever thoughts, memories, images, and sensations arise within you. Because children are experiential. They're ruled by their senses and their imagination. So if you want to really understand how a child or how your own inner child works, or what ecological consciousness really is or what it feels like. You have to temporarily let go of and suspend your adult rational logical selves. All right, so again, remember, uh, take in the following slides and sections through your senses and then just allow yourself to kind of be immersed in, in the images and the colors and, and my words, my voice. So remember when you were a child. You were born into a world of pure sensation. Temperature, darkness, light, moisture, physical contact, hunger, touch. There was no separation between you, your body, and your environment. You either developed trust that the world was a good and safe place and that your needs were met by others. Or if your needs were not met, you developed a feeling of fear and mistrust and a belief that the world was an inconsistent and unpredictable, scary place. From your earliest days of life, from when you were held in the waters of your mother's womb, did you feel safe and wanted? When you emerged on the outside world on the day of your birth, did you feel welcomed into life, that you belonged here, in your body, to your family, on this earth, in this community, or did you somehow feel unwelcomed, unwanted, and unsure if you really belonged? As you grew a little older, as a toddler, you developed a sense of autonomy and independence in your body, wanting to try and do things all by yourself. You were curious and wanted to explore and discover your abilities. And you had big emotions. How did others respond to you? Were your explorations supported and encouraged? Were your emotions and experiences validated and witnessed? Or did you develop shame and doubt about exploring and expressing yourself? You started to realize that you had your own body and your own will, but did you also learn that you lived in relationship 
in connection to the world around you and others? Did you explore the natural world and environment as your larger home? Or was there not an opportunity to explore the natural world around you, leaving you feeling separated and insulated and disconnected from others and the world outside the walls of your home? As you got a little older and went to preschool and kindergarten, you were very curious and you asked a lot of questions. You started experimenting and making up your own games and rules, taking risks that demonstrated your initiative, your imagination and your creativity. And how did others respond to you? Did you feel comfortable and confident, supported and encouraged? Or did you feel like you were a burden on others, guilty for taking up time and space, unsure of your ideas, abilities, and place? Did you have the opportunity to be outside and feel safe exploring and playing in the natural world, communicating with your environment? Did you develop confidence and competence in your ability to navigate the natural world or did nature somehow feel scary and dangerous? As you continued in school and activities, you started to notice differences between yourself and others, what you were good at and what others were better at. Could you see these differences without feeling bad or inferior about yourself? Could you see what made you unique as well as what similarities we all share. And did you develop a kinship with all life forms in both the human and the non-human community? A sense of reciprocity and empathy with all life forms rather than dominance and superiority over non-human life forms. Did you learn how your actions had positive and negative effects on the world and on others around you? How life didn't have to be a competition with only one winner, but that there was a way for everyone and everything to get along and thrive? As you became an adolescent, you started asking yourself, who am I? Where am I going in my life? What is my identity? But you weren't just interested in discovering your unique ecological place in the web of life separate from others. You also asked yourself, how do I fit in and contribute to and strengthen the web of life by sharing my unique skills, talents and expression of myself in collaboration with and benefit for all. And so you made your way into the world as an adult. Now, I know as a psychiatrist and just as a human being, most of us do not get through childhood with all of these developmental stages successfully accomplished. And I actually don't believe that's even possible or what we're meant to do. Because as adults, we often have to go back and reclaim those areas of our development that either we're not, uh, we're either not success successfully or, or, complete, or completed. And that's just a part of the human experience. And so now I wanna go back and go over Erickson's theories of psychosocial development side by side along with my own theory of ecological consciousness development um, so we can compare and contrast what might be missing in some of our theories. So Erickson's first developmental stage of infancy, he, he dubbed the task of developing either trust or mistrust in the world, where essentially the question is, can I trust the world? And I believe alongside that, infants also need to develop a sense of belonging versus not belonging, where they're really answering the question of, do I feel like I belong in this world? 
In the toddler years, Erickson's developmental task he dubbed autonomy versus shame and doubt. Where, where children are basically asking themselves, is it okay to be me? And I believe this is the time where children also need to develop a sense of either connection versus separation, a feeling of how am I connected to others in this world? As children get a little older, Erickson theorized the, the stage of initiative versus guilt, where children are asking themselves, is it okay for me to do, move, act, and explore? And I believe this is the age that children also develop a sense of either safety or danger. Do they feel safe and competent navigating the natural world? And many, oftentimes in our modern world these days, uh, children don't have an opportunity to be, to be out in nature. So they don't develop the sense of safety and competence in navigating the natural world and even adults. School-age children, Erickson theorized, was a, was a time of the developmental task of industry versus inferiority, where children are really looking at themselves in comparison to their peers and asking, can I make it in this world? And I believe that the question they also need to be developing and asking themselves is a sense of reciprocity versus superiority where the question is, how can we all make it in this world? Not just the humans, but the non-human life forms as well. And in adolescence, Erickson's developmental task, he called identity versus role confusion, where young, children, young adults are asking themselves, who am I and who can I be? And I believe that adolescence with an ecological consciousness are also, ask, are also trying to find their place versus being lost. And they're asking themselves, how can I fit in? And how can I contribute to this web of life? So as you can see, when we put Erickson's theories alongside an ecological consciousness theory, um, modern Western psychology is very based on the development of the individual self and ego in separation and isolation from the greater web of life and our interconnectedness. And if this is the model that we teach and cultivate as healthy development in, in our schools and our mental health systems um, and in society at large, then we completely ignore this vital part of our experience of human, of human as a human and our, our need to feel like we belong in this world, our sense of connection with the natural world, and our sense of safety and reciprocity and, and place that um, I find can be really, um, so many adults are, are seeking this and feeling the lack of that. So some things to consider is how do we cultivate and strengthen ecological consciousness in children and adults? And I wanna thank you just for coming to this talk because just by coming to this talk, you've already strengthened your ecological consciousness just by bringing your awareness to this and hopefully stimulating some, some of your own queries and inquiries and curiosities. And I want to invite you to start continue to have conversations and bring awareness to this top topic after you leave this talk. Um, just start talking to people and bringing awareness to this because having an ecological consciousness doesn't mean you have to go live in the wild. <laughs> you can have a strong, healthy ecological consciousness living in the modern world. And that actually is the task of our times is how do we have a strong, healthy ecological consciousness while living modern lives? And what happens if we don't develop an ecological consciousness? How does this impact our physical and mental health and sense of well-being, as well as the health and well-being of our planet? 
And I think the answer to that is, is what we're seeing today um, in just our own physical and mental health around the world, the amount of, the amount of disease and, and mental health symptoms that, that we see arising, and also in the, in the destruction and uh, care of our environment, when we don't really understand that caring for the world we live in really means caring about our future and ourselves, then, then we see the environmental imbalances and destruction that we see today. So what small or big changes can you make in your life today to develop or strengthen your ecological consciousness? And this is something that we can, we can talk about and discuss. So that's, those are all the slides, the formal slides that I have prepared, but I'm really interested in having a discussion and answering questions and talking about um, what, what I just talk, presented. And if you have any questions or comments and want to reach out to me, you can, you can find me online or email me. I really call myself a multidimensional psychiatrist interested in the work of human ecological restoration and really restoring people's inner landscapes and consciousness back to this ecological consciousness. So this is really my passion and my purpose and I love connecting and collaborating. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen share right now and, and bring us back to Peter to lead us. Um, Great, well, thank you, Liz. Thank you for a wonderful presentation and uh, a lot of strong reminders of the complexity, the complexity of even trying to encapsulate what um, the stages of growth are and how we move along through those various stages. And, you know, there are competing theories out there, absolutely. Um, the Erickson theories are certainly the, the more prominent and um, so thank you. And I, I like some of the ideas that you were uh, utilizing in terms of developing your own theory around this. One of the um, difficulties that we all struggle for as adults is um, we gradually get kind of these increasing responsibilities uh, whether they be educational responsibilities, relationship responsibilities, financial and economics, uh, just the desire to do many different things and experiment in the world. And as those come on, we tend to forget some of those core things that start to uh, gel in and around that seven to 10 year old mark. And, and yet I'm a very, very much aware that most of us have primarily identified who we're going to be in this world by the time we're about eight or ten. <laughs> and from then on, it's just kind of, you know, peripheral stuff that's around us. But as you point out, we tend to forget about that, that eco-consciousness that we've arrived at naturally in that uh, early childhood stages. So how do we get back to it? How do we get back to it? I, we all enjoy being adults. We enjoy this complexity of managing these different influences, but then we also have this drive to want to get back to some of that joy and meaning of childhood. How do we do that? Yeah, Peter. Well, I think you, um, you made an interesting point about how children might decide who they're going to be in this world at age eight to 10. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but that is the time in our in, in Erickson's model of the development, um, as well as in just school age, when, when children are really comparing themselves to others, and, and his question was, how do I make it in this world? And I think the way our, our educational systems are, are structured and developed, and just sort of, not just school, but our society, there's this strong pressure for kids to, to really, to really, really kind of compare themselves and to really feel like I have to do something to, to be successful. And I think that, that insecurity or that, uh, the roots of that insecurity that might follow us throughout our adolescence and young adulthood or, or adulthood 
really, I think, prevents us from relaxing into the truth that we're all in this together and that we don't have to compete for resources, for our own success or for... Um, so I think, I think really it's, it's kind of reminding our, our kids through the way that we, we evaluate them by the way we shepherd them through their lives that, that this is not a competition. This is not about like, if I, if I just make it, then that's the end game. It's about really like we're, we're all in this together and how can we each, we each have a unique contribution to this web mm -hmm. and we're, we're all gonna make it together. If we really want to make it, we have to all make it together. And so I think even as adults, um, you know, really challenging our framework of what success is and what, um, you know, what, what is our unique place and contribution? Right, yeah, and I think um, some of the other stuff that I've been reading about and I just made me aware of, um, you know, we come through that late uh, period of early childhood and then we get into teen, and uh, we've got these incredible influences from social media and being in the general media, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't necessarily have that balanced view of what nature is or what nature could be. Uh, and yet in the younger generations, um, certainly in teens, early 20s, et cetera, folks are paying an awful lot of attention to the ecology, to the environment, and to how do we make it better? And they're actually fearful of it. They're fearful that we're not treating it properly. And so it's creating its, its own trauma, if you will. And yet it's a paradox, isn't it? They, they're fearful of what's happening to nature and yet they haven't had the opportunity necessarily to experience nature properly. And so, um, and, and, and Riel Eguchi uh, has posted a comment in the chat box about terror management, um, terror management theory. Um, it's a, a wonderful comment there about how our culture buffers our existential anxieties. And, uh, and yet, um, I love this catchphrase here, disnifying nature, for example. Real, great, 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 great <laughs> comment there. But so how do we deal with this ex existential trauma in a way that's healthier for us? This paradox that I just described, this disnifying, and how do we help people kind of... Uh, get past that so that we're more accepting? What would be some of your comments there? Yeah, I, I feel like there's such a multi-pronged approach to, to restoring this ecological consciousness. Um, there's, there's no one answer and it's, it's so, it's, it's so um, multidisciplinary. And it, because it, it, it's really where we're at, our current relationship to nature is so deeply challenged and disturbed from multiple levels, from, from education to, to media, to our, our economy and um, our businesses. And, and so I think it's really about each person reclaiming their connection and then doing their part in, in sort of in whatever sphere of influence that they have, really kind of extending their sphere of influence um, into wider, wider circles, interconnecting circles that will, that will eventually bring, bring us all back into harmony. But but we have a lot of work to do. We really do. And, um, you know, we, we have to start with ourselves. We have to start with our own relationship to ourselves and our true nature. And, and then kind of ask, how, how are we 
connected to, to this greater web and how, how are we extending and strengthening it? And I think, you know, just having more conversations like this, having more experiences, having more connections. Um, yeah, I'd really, I'd really love to hear from people like what's coming up for them in terms of What's interesting, Emma, you. Um, Emma's yeah. got a comment in there about how her, wow. um, her young son is already developing that concern for nature and why are people behaving the way they are. So it's, again, part of this is that paradox, if you will, that um, you know, we're not necessarily giving the kids the, the greatest exposure. Uh, they've got concerns. And yet what you're suggesting is it's still up to us as adults to kind of not only identify the current environment, but then how do we instigate the change to create this? And, you know, an eco-consciousness type of movement is starting. It's starting in a variety of ways in not only uh, this country in the United States, but many countries. And like all social movements, it will take a period of time for that to gain uh, traction because there's all these other competing forces out there. Um, one initiative that I'm aware of in, in the United States is uh, in part sponsored from the National Park Service, but it was instigated by a pediatrician. And um, it's called Park RX. And the simple concept is that as a clinician who sees kids, even though they're healthy, that physician or provider should write a prescription, go to the park once a day for 30 minutes, or go to the park four times a week for 30 minutes. And there's a recognition that, you know, by kind of having this come from a position of authority that these kids and these families will then hopefully recognize the importance of it. There's good science evolving that you know the um, benefits psychologically, biochemically, physiologically, hormonally are clearly there as it relates to getting exposed to nature. Intriguingly, even if we put on the virtual reality goggles for 15 minutes and watch nature scenes, we'll get physiologic and hormonal benefits in there as well. So, um, so in all of this, um, Lolita's got a question in here. She's interested in how to implement, and that's part of what I'm talking about. How do we implement? You've helped us characterize, <laughs> told us to network, but how do we implement? How do we implement? Yeah. Would you, yeah, uh, and after Liz talks, would you mind sharing that slide we have? Because it talks about implementing. What kind of things can you do? And especially, it also speaks to Rial's question of trauma and grief. Yeah, by all means. So please answer that question on how do we implement, and then we'll bring up a, a slide uh, from Louise Shala, I think, that uh, helps to encapsulate some of this as well. Yeah, so yeah, Lolita, your question about how do, you, how do I implement this in, into my practice? And you know, I don't have all the answers, so I, I'm only one voice. Um, but I will just share that um, there's no substitute for just spending more time in nature. Um, sometimes we, we, we complicate, we actually, humans, as, we complicate things so much. So I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in simplifying, simplifying things. And, and Barbara, you also asked, are there any exercises that we, I can suggest for adults to recapture? some of our childhood connections to nature. So I would say that there's no substitute just for spending more time outside. And it doesn't even have to be, you don't have to even go to a pristine wilderness. There's just something about spending more time outside with our senses, recalibrating with the, 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 the larger world out there. So if we talk about being in relationship to, to nature and the environment, just spending time outside of our walls and our homes um, and just feeling, feeling all the senses of, of what it's like to be outside and outdoors. 
Now, with that said, once you once you have reestablished that connection, I really do feel like there's these stages of reconnecting to your ecological consciousness. And in the beginning, there's no substitute for you actually having to spend time reawakening your body's physical sensations to being in the outside world. But once you reawaken that and you've reestablished that connection, I have found that it stays with you so that even when you're indoors and not necessarily outdoors, the, re the, the reconnection has been reestablished. So you can, you can kind of call it up and feel it um, even when you're not outside and, or it's easier to reconnect it. So I do think there's these stages of reconnection. In the beginning, you do, if you've been disconnected from the natural environment, there's no substitute for actually spending more time outdoors and in the natural world. And then there's stages of, of, of increasing consciousness and awareness. As your body reawakens to that reconnection, you can, um, it just stays alive within you because you are a living, you are a living part of nature. So, so nature is not just out there, but it's inside you. So when you awaken that part inside you, then you are part, you, you become more alive um, in that way. And you carry that with you. Yeah, and there's some good scientific uh, evidence out there. If you just go up for a short period of time, the physiologic and hormonal shifts that occur um, and benefit your immune system are long lasting. And yeah, they gradually taper down over time, but long lasting upwards of a month in some cases. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's well past us just thinking, oh, I feel good for some reason. Let me go outside more. There's, there's clearly uh, these, these um, biochemical, physiologic, hormonal benefits. And uh, Amber's made the comment as, as well in here that um, as a therapist herself, she gives the family, similar to what I was talking about with the pediatrician in Park Rx, give them the homework, go outside, make that part of your habits. And, um, you know, we've got a, a wonderful slide I want to ask Ida to, to pull up that sort of yes. encapsulates some of those, some of those benefits. I, I will do that. I will do that. But first, also, there are people who live in societies or cities that there is no nature available to them. Yeah. So with that, you can bring, you know, plant a seed, right? Help your child plant a seed and watch it grow and discuss it. You can read um, ecological. There's so many books about nature and interacting with nature that um, that's also another exercise. Um, something that the children, you can do with children. And here, can you see that now, Peter? Uh, yeah, you have to make it go and hit the play button at the top. Oh, thank you, thank you. There we go. Yeah, so I think Liz, um, as, as I was doing some of my own research for this presentation of yours, um, I read through your stuff and I think it's wonderfully well put together. But <clears throat> Luis Chala's stuff uh, encapsulated a lot of this as well. And if you look at, and each of those bubbles are busy, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, that bottom left bullet there, time watching TV, social media, all those things decrease your connectivity to, to nature. And as you pointed out, some of that actually naturally gets lost in adolescence. Um, but for that top left pinkish sort of bullet experiences that can increase connectivity, look at that adults who improve, who promote engagement with nature and empathy for living things, nurturing parenting styles, providing access and time. Um, the female gender seems to do better by increasing this connectivity than us males. And there's, um, you know, the indigenous values, which you mentioned at the very beginning of all of this. And if we can expand the importance and the abilities for people to deliver that, then it leads into these benefits, greater connection itself to nature, 
benefits associated, it's intrinsically positive experiences, pro-social behavior, good health, well-being, less complaining, creativity goes up, and then the behaviors change too. There's an improved environmental knowledge, a willingness to conserve nature, be a good citizen, and some very pro-nature behaviors. And I see Emma's uh, followed up with uh, uh, another good link there in terms of things we can do. So I think there's one other slide there that, that um, I looked at. If you could just hit your forward button, um, that would be great, Ida. Yes, and this actually speaks to reals about trauma because children, uh, children feel that trauma as uh, another woman was saying about why, why are people cutting trees? And they're feeling this trauma about, you know, the species extinction, they're feeling, and it needs to be acknowledged with them. So I'll let you take it, Peter. No, no, I, I think you're doing a great job with it. It's, it's a tough slide to read. And, We'll make sure that uh, the slides are distributed, these couple of slides, uh, along with um, Liz's. But, um, you know, we can try to prevent the trauma, but then trauma occurs. And maybe if you want to stop sharing, uh, Ida, as well. And some of what you were saying earlier, Liz, um, you know, the military is uh, utilizing nature very heavily these days for uh, post-traumatic stress disorders. And uh, you just have to stop sharing your screen, Ida, not just oh, uh, Pokemon. Yes, if I could, I, no, no, I can't. My, <laughs> the, the button that says stop sharing isn't coming up. <laughs> that's that's why I, well, I we'll can't just, see. Yeah, we're getting- Yeah, just talk over, right? please, please talk over me while I, I, I can, I yeah, just yeah, can't I, seem I, to find it. Happy to do so, it's usually at the top. Um, it's not the uh, where I was going, Liz, and I'd love welcome your comments. Is um, and it's getting back to nature after we've lost that connectivity. And the military is uh, finding with the PTSD folks that if you expose them in an organized way into nature, take them out for a week and have brief and debrief sessions those folks tend to do very, very well. And a big part of what they recognize is it helps them get back to their childhood and those feelings of wonder and awe by nature. And it helps them get to some degree past their PTSD, not perfectly, but what, what are some of your thoughts about that side of it? Yeah, I, I think your comments on, on just awe and wonder are, are um, you know, so, so healing that sometimes, again, going back to kind of just simplifying things. Um, and I want to talk, talk, touch base on Michelle, your comment on, like, on sort of this, these feelings of despair, which can lead to sort of feelings of, of hopelessness and paralysis. Um, sometimes we can get really paralyzed by, 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 feeling like how much work there is to do and how much systems have to change. And, and we can really feel like, like, oh my God, there's so much we need to do um, and so much we need to heal in order for us to move forward. And then, and then we can also just be outside and watch a beautiful sunset or watch a bird. And, and, and that sort of childlike sense of everything is okay and everything is fine and the world is a beautiful place can really be restored to us. So I think these mindfulness practices, even just small mindfulness practices where we are really restored to this experience of what a beautiful world we live in, even if it's not perfect, even if it's being, even if it's currently hurting and there's a lot of healing to be, to still be uh, experienced that there's still so much good and there's still so much beauty and awe that we can experience on a regular basis, just even right now. And I think when we can just reconnect to that, that presence of this, this, this 
beauty and awe that children that children naturally have if we can kind of reconnect to that as an adult and um i think that really buffers a lot of the adult like problems that we have built up <laughs> not to say that there we don't have to also transform and remodel the way a lot of our systems um, currently are. But I, I think when we can just reconnect with those experiences of ourselves and look at the world through child's eyes again, we can, re we can find that place within ourselves that, that feels really well, some of us do that naturally. Some of us do that naturally. Most of us on this call probably do that naturally. Um, but part of the trick is to how to help others recognize it. How do you become better parents? I mean, we're getting married and being a parent are two of the biggest, largest social experiments out there, right? We never get trained for it and we jump right in. So how do we become better parents? And how do we help our kids be better? And we can't, we haven't got the time to solve those today, but that's part of all of this. And those on the call, we kind of are already there, but there's a larger audience that we have to help to try and recognize what is eco consciousness. How do we help our kids? How do we network with other adults to make it a broader, bit more healthy society? And you know, getting out there and, and living a mindfulness type of uh, practice, getting into nature ourselves, promoting it, writing about it, poetry, reading books about it. Etc. Those are all, there's a multiplicity of ways in, in which to do that. And, you know, we've got um, a, just a large number of tools out there for us. And one of the things that scares me the most, quite honestly, is the significant gender differences in terms of how little boys and adult boys perceive nature and, and that sort of alpha behavior that they often demonstrate. And, and women uh, and little girls, um, oftentimes seem to have a little bit more confidence issues, but that shouldn't be the case. And, you know, how, how do we help to accommodate for these different things and how do we promote all of that stuff? Um, this has is, this is, uh, just been a wonderful talk and, and I, I'd like to just thank you so much for the time, the energy and the effort that you've put into it. For those of you who have uh, put comments and suggestions and links in there, um, thank you for that. We'll record all of those comments in the, in the chat box. We'll make sure that the slides are aware for everybody. Available, I meant to say. And uh, Ida, do you have any closing comments before I make my last comments? No, I just wanted to thank Liz very, very much for the wonderful presentation and to you, Peter, for hosting and, and adding uh, richness to the conversation. So thank you everyone for, um, for being here today. We're very, very grateful. Peter? Yeah, thanks Ida. Thank you, Liz. Thank you everyone. And as, as you digest this further, please share more with Irie Wild and have a look, a more close look at the Irie Wild website. Uh, the availability of today's uh, conference will be there. There'll be future conferences coming on in the near future. And we've got some wonderful podcasts up there where we continue to share the learning as we help all ourselves, but more importantly, as we help others to uh, improve their living creative energies in our natural world. If you're an established or an emerging thought leader and, and would like to join our team or find out more, uh, just give, get in touch with us. Our research, our initiatives, all these things are there. We, we've got a wonderful, very robust uh, ebook there for downloading and gives a, a much stronger sense. So thank you all for joining today. And again, thank you, Liz, for a wonderful presentation and great discussions. Take care. Thank you, everyone. And just in my closing remarks, I just, I feel like the one thing that I want to leave everyone with is, is our interconnectedness, is that we're not all doing this alone, that, that each one of us is playing our part. And, and it's just really, being really tuned into that interconnectedness of, of you know, there's, there is a lot of work and a lot of healing and a lot of change that needs to be done, but we're all 
we're all doing our part and we're doing it together. And so, you know, that's, um, that's the piece that I really want to leave everyone with. So right. thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Enjoy your lives. Thank you.